Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our gospel lesson for the Feast of the Epiphany. Uh, Actually, not the gospel lesson, but our epistle lesson from the Epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians, the third chapter, especially verses 4 through 6, in which St. Paul writes, You can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is the text. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, St. Paul speaks here of a mystery. And when he speaks of a mystery, he means something far grander and deeper than what we think of now as the mystery genre. You know, we enjoy a number of mystery series. USA has had a couple of uh, home runs in the Monk series and Psych. In one of these, you have an obsessive compulsive detective named Adrian Monk, whose uh, tendencies actually help him to be a better detective, more effective at solving mysteries. In Psych, you have uh, a young man named Sean Spencer, who uh, is very good at deducing things from evidence, but he frames his revelations as if they're psychic uh, perceptions, and he passes himself off as a psychic detective, when in fact he's really just a, a good problem solver. There's something that these mysteries have in common. You go through an hour or 42 minutes without ads, and right at the end, there's the big reveal. And the detective says, here's what happened. And usually the style of the filming will change as he goes through the past and shows everything that led up to the the murder or the theft or whatever the mystery is. And then it becomes clear who the perpetrator is. The mystery has been solved. There are no more secrets. The detective has unearthed the truth. Now, a really good mystery, when you come to that final moment of revelation, you'll say, of course, that's what it had to be. I saw all the clues, I just didn't put it together. A really good mystery you're not going to solve on your own, but once you see the solution, you'll recognize that it had to be that way all along. Now, one thing about Monk and Psyche is that they're very character-driven. The mysteries tend, I think, to suffer a little bit. But if you want a really good mystery for the mystery's own sake, we really enjoy the Poirot series, and that's uh, Agatha Christie. She's really good at doing just that, giving you all the clues that you should need to solve the mystery, and yet you still just can't quite get there until the detective has made the big reveal at the end. And when he makes his big reveal, you realize, yes, that's how it had to be. I had all of the information I needed to draw the same conclusion, but I'm just not as smart as he is. Now, in that sense, there really is something in common with the mystery that St. Paul is talking about. All the clues have been there all along. And once the mystery has been revealed to us, it seems obvious, of course, that's how it had to be all along. But nobody realized it. No one put all of the clues together until God's revelation to us in Christ. Now what is this mystery? This great secret that had been hidden from time immemorial. And now finally in the age of the apostles, it is revealed to all people. Well, for us, when we find out what the mystery is, it may be kind of a letdown because it seems so obvious to us. The great mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. The great mystery is that you get to go to heaven. But the fact is, through much of the history of the church, of Israel, that was not so well understood. Most people believed that we Gentiles, we heathen, and that's what the word Gentile really means, we heathen, we nations who did not believe in the one true God of Israel, we are all condemned to everlasting damnation. That was the assumption. 
And really it was a reasonable assumption because it was to Israel that had been given the law and the prophets, all of the promises of the Christ, the promise of salvation, and all of those heathens, all of the tribes, all of the Gentiles of the world. They weren't living according to God's law and they were without God in the world. But really the clues are there. The clues are there right from the beginning. You take the first promise of the Christ that was ever made in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve, that from the woman would come the offspring, the seed, who would crush the serpent's head. He would undo the work of the devil. He would deliver us from sin and death. So to whom was this promise made, the very first promise of the Christ? To whom was it made? It wasn't made to Abraham. It wasn't made to Israel. It wasn't made to the Jews. It was made to the first parents of the entire human race. It was made to your ancestors, according to the flesh. The first promise of the Christ was for all the world. Now, it's true, in ages to come, that promise would be narrowed. You do come to Abraham, and God promises him that in uh, his offspring there would be a great nation, and so on. But even then, the promise isn't just for Abraham. God says that in his offspring would all the nation, that is, all the Gentiles, all the heathen of the earth, be blessed. So even at the outset of the history of Israel, we have a promise that their blessing is a blessing for all the world, for all the Gentiles. And a detective sifting through these Old Testament promises should be able to tell that the heathen, the Gentiles, are destined for salvation as well. But that wasn't so obvious to those first believers. And then you go down through the generations, you get to Judah, to whom it is promised that the scepter will never depart from him. But if you think about it, if he is to rule, being a ruler isn't for his own benefit. The promise of a ruler is chiefly to those who are being ruled. So even there we have a clue that we're not just talking about Israel, but we're talking about all of the people of the world. We would all fall under the gracious rule of the line of the tribe of Judah. And then you go to David. The promise to David that he would not like a man to sit on his throne forever, that his kingdom would be everlasting. Here too, the promise isn't primarily to David. The promise is to all of us who benefit from the rule of his son. All through these Old Testament prophecies, you have pretty clear clues that salvation through the Christ is ultimately intended not just for the people of Israel, but for the entire world. And it becomes most clear when you get into the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah repeatedly prophesies that it is too small a thing for salvation just to be for the Jews. God intends His Christ to save the entire world. All the heathen are to be called to God's holy Mount Zion. All of the heathen are to worship the God of Israel and find their salvation in Him. The pall that is cast over all people, death and hell, is to be removed entirely so that all the nations, all of the heathen, all of the Gentiles can enjoy the salvation that is of the Jews. But these are all still just clues. They haven't made the mystery absolutely plain. And in fact, after the coming of Christ, even when he commanded his disciples that they were to preach the gospel in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth, once it became obvious that Jesus intended the gospel to be preached also to the Gentiles, they didn't listen. The first church stayed right there in Jerusalem, ministering only to those descended from Abraham according to the flesh. Salvation was not yet proclaimed to the Gentiles. And so it took special actions of God to bring about the mission to the Gentiles. Under the wise providence of God, a persecution arose in Jerusalem that drove Christian preachers out of the holy city and out into the broader world. 
That was when the gospel first really started coming to Gentiles. And then you have St. Paul, whose mission it was at the outset to destroy the Christian church. He's on his way to the city of Damascus to imprison Christians. And while he's traveling, he has a revelation of Christ. Jesus appears to him on the road and sets him apart to be specifically the apostle to the Gentiles. And it will be Paul's great struggle for the rest of his, mystery, of his ministry to reveal that mystery to all. That he came to bring salvation not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs. And yet, the Jewish church still had to be convinced. So God performed more miracles to show them that yes, indeed, the gospel is to be preached also to the Gentiles. Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body with the Jews, and partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. God brought this about through a vision to St. Peter. Peter was at a house in Joppa. I've gotten to be in Joppa before. In fact, it was in Joppa that I first decided I liked fish. When I was growing up, if my mom would make fish, I would turn up my nose at it and refuse to eat it. I'm kind of ashamed of how I treated much of my mom's cooking growing up. I recognize now how good it was. But the first time I ate and enjoyed fish was in a restaurant in Joppa. I had this thing with the head still on it, eyes staring up at me. But the, the meat was just so uh, fluffy and delicious. Uh, I imagine that Peter probably ate fish in Joppa too. And as he was in Joppa, he was up on the rooftop praying at the set regular hour of prayer. And he beheld a vision. And in this vision, God let down a sheet by its four corners, and in the sheet were unclean animals of all different kinds. And God says to Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Now, this is a horrifying command to Peter because he knows that all of these things are forbidden him in Moses' law. Now, Peter perhaps should have been paying closer attention when Jesus taught that it is not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out from his heart. Mark says that by saying that, Jesus made all foods clean. But that was apparently lost on Peter, who was still bound in his conscience to these laws concerning what you can and cannot eat. And so he said, no, none of these unclean foods have ever touched my lips. And God says, what God has made clean, what God has called clean, do not call unclean. And this has to happen three times. When God really wants to make a point, he does it three times. And then Peter gets a visit, a visit from some emissaries of Cornelius, who had been told in a vision that he was to find this man Peter in the city of Joppa and bring him over to proclaim to him good news. So Peter comes with these emissaries and enters into the household of the Gentile Cornelius. By doing that, he became unclean, according to Moses' law. He entered under the roof of a Gentile, of a heathen. And there he preached the word to Cornelius and his heathen Gentile household. And as he preached the word concerning Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit descended visibly upon these Gentiles, just like he had done at Pentecost. And Peter says, who can withhold water from baptizing these people? God has made it clear through the manifestation of his Spirit that the Gentiles too are to inherit eternal life. And so Cornelius and his household are all baptized. Peter realizes that that vision on the rooftop in Joppa was intended to convince him that it was God's will that the gospel come also to the Gentiles. But even then, it takes some convincing for the rest of the Jewish Christian church to believe that the Gentiles are indeed fellow heirs. In fact, as a result of the diaspora, when the Christians are driven out of Jerusalem in the persecution, a bunch of Gentiles in Antioch are called to faith. We establish an entire congregation made up mostly of Gentile believers. To this congregation, St. Paul was called to be a pastor. He was specifically called to be apostle to the Gentiles. 
And this congregation, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sent St. Paul over to Galatia to make Christians of those who had not yet heard the gospel. Paul goes around to all the synagogues, but after he's rejected at every synagogue, he turns to the Gentiles. And he shares the promise of Christ with those who had been without God in the world. And in every city where Paul goes, a new congregation is formed that includes Gentile believers as fellow heirs. But after establishing all of these congregations, Paul has a great frustration when false teachers from Jerusalem come up to disrupt his work. And they go to all of these congregations in Galatia and they tell them, no, Paul was wrong. The Gentiles are not fellow heirs of salvation. If you want to be saved through Jesus Christ, you have to be circumcised. You have to submit to the law of Moses. In other words, you have to cease to be a Gentile and you have to become a Jew. Uh, Paul responded to this crisis by writing his wonderful letter to the Galatians. But it led finally to a church council in Jerusalem. It took all of these pastors and teachers within the church to meet and hash out their differences for the whole church finally to accept this mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now we all take that for granted. It seems to us the most natural thing in the world that we Gentiles should inherit everlasting life. But the fact is it was not always so. There was a time when your salvation was a great and deep and hidden mystery that none but a few select prophets had any inkling of. Now, we went through all of these miraculous works of God by which he finally convinced his church that they were to incorporate the Gentiles as well. But actually, one of the most striking revelations that showed us that salvation is for the Gentiles came very soon after the birth of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was born... God placed a sign in the heavens to show that the King of the Jews had been born. And this sign in the heavens was seen and understood by heathen Gentile astrologers in the East. And these sinful Gentile heathen astrologers saw this sign in the heavens, this star, and they knew a king has been born in Judea. Let us go and worship him. This miraculous manifestation of the Christ to the wise men drew them from the east so that they could come to the holy city of God. And already Isaiah's prophecy began to be fulfilled as the Gentiles came streaming to Jerusalem, to the holy city of God, Mount Zion, to find their salvation in the Christ. It is there that the search is narrowed down. They hear from the word of God that the Christ is to be born in Bethlehem. They go there and through a special miracle of God, the star shows them the specific house where they can find their salvation in the Christ. And they find him and these heathen, Gentile astrologers bow down in worship to the one true God and find in him their salvation from sin and death. December 25th may properly be called Christmas for the Jews because on December 25th, Jesus' birth was revealed to the Jewish shepherds. But January 6th might well be called Christmas for the Gentiles because at the epiphany of our Lord Jesus Christ, it was revealed to you that the Christ is not only for his own people, his own flesh and blood in Israel, he was also for all of the nations. That the great mystery has finally been revealed. And you all are called to believe in that salvation which is of the Jews. God grant that this great mystery hidden through so many ages may be made plain to us. That it may be no mystery to us that our salvation comes through Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, the Son of David who brings salvation to the entire world. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.